joined by Dr. Sam Moxon, who is a research associate at the University of Manchester. Hi, Sam. Hi. I realised, you know, out of everybody who's presented today, I know a lot of people already. I can't, and I've never met you before. I don't think we've... Yeah. You, I've not dragged you into any of my other stuff that I do. So. Well, I think it's because um, I tend to go to different different conferences to a lot of people. So, like, yeah, I know you've met other people from my research group, like James Quinn, who uh, was yeah. in my research group for a while. But because I, I come more from a uh, material science side with a bit of biology as well, I tend to to go to different types of conferences, which is usually where you meet uh, is, people and, you meet and that kind of thing. Well, so. I've got my hooks into you now, so we'll be getting you on to do podcasts and webinars. For Sounds good, yeah. I love a podcast. So. So, so I should add that for anybody who's watching this who didn't already know, so the, the, the day job involves um, trying to support early career researcher uh, careers as well. We have a website called dementiaresearcher.nhr.ac.uk. Uh, they're cr very kindly letting me use their YouTube channel today to stream this um and um so any early career researchers that are watching that are interested in getting involved in that community there are lots of resources there and lots of podcasts and webinars and blogs and things as well that you might find interesting uh, i'm also joined by professor louise serple who i do know we've met a few times now yeah hi yeah um louise uh, is a professor of biochemistry at the university <laughs> of sussex and is also wearing a brilliant Chatathon t-shirt. Of which I'm delighted with it. It's been much admired today. I've You've worn got it all two day. as well, haven't you? I have <laughs> <it>. <laughs> one to wash and one to wear. Mm. Uh, thank you very much both. Well, I tell you what, Louise, you said you'd made something for us to watch. So is, is this talking about your research? Yes. I, I mean, I could show you some movies about something else entirely if you like. But no, no, I, know, I, have, I have got That's That sounded ominous. I, I thought you have to wait till over after eight and I've opened the wine for that. No. <laughs> no, so um I um because I work on protein folding, and as you said at the beginning, you um you you weren't all that sure about what we did. Um I well, thought it might be good to explain it a bit. Well, I was either that or I was gonna pin you down to try and explain this because I, mm. I'm sure I've seen your pictures from standing on soapboxes in Brighton and things. So I know that you're amazing at explaining the science in a way that everybody can understand. Oh, I'll do my um, best on that one. But uh, yeah, well, go ahead. Let's, let's well, I do that. Time. And then you can have a tiny break, you poor thing. We'll hear about your work. We and we'll, we'll come to you as well, because uh, I'm interested in Sam's work too, about because I've, I've not heard anything like that before. Yeah, I promise not to take up too much time, Sam, and I am obviously looking forward to hearing what you, you've got to say. And actually, <laughs> yeah, there might be something overlapping. Anyway, shall I start? I'll just, put, yeah, I'm going to share, down, I'm going to share my screen. I was listening um, earlier today, I think it was about half past 11, something like that, and people were talking about proteins. Um, and, the, and, and we, in dementia, I think you've heard quite a lot about this today, is that um, you have proteins that misfold. And so I thought I'd mention that proteins fold. Um, and someone earlier today said, you know, this proteins fold into a very specific structure. So this is an example of a a protein that folds, and this is its its um, structure when you um, solve its structure, um, and this allows it to fulfil its function. This um, protein is actually um, lysozyme, so um, it, it's an enzyme. Um, and so, really, what I wanted to talk about was what happens when proteins misfold. And so, what happens in Alzheimer's disease? You've heard about amyloid beta, and you've heard about tau, probably. Um, and you've probably also heard about other things like dipeptide C9 off 72 in frontal temporal dementia. Um, and what happens is that these native protein structures uh, misfold. So instead of folding into the correct structure, they fold into the incorrect structure, which involves self-assembly. So we've got one protein chain here that self-assembles with another one and so on and so on until it forms what we call an amyloid fibril. And just to confuse you all, we use amyloid, amyloid plaques to explain uh, what happens in Alzheimer's disease, but actually amyloid is loads of different proteins. It's actually just a definition of a, a protein that misfolds. Um, and so I wanted to show you what I mean by self-assembly. So these are some little peptides in a box. If you give them a little bit of a shake um, in um, silico, then what's happening to these peptides is that they like to stick together. And so you, the odd one you can see on its own here, but every now and then it starts to assemble. And you can see that it's quite organized the way that it assembles into these, um, these structures. And this is really to depict what's happening in terms of amyloid. So, so, um, 
So what is amyloid? Well, we've talked about amyloid beta, which is in Alzheimer's disease, but actually amyloid forms in all sorts of different diseases and not just neurodegenerative diseases, also in things like uh, type two diabetes um, in the pancreas and also um, in the heart in a disease called amyloid light chain amyloidosis. And basically this is a disease where you have an overproduction of antibodies and they deposit as amyloid fibrils in um, the heart muscle. So you can see here a normal heart and on the right hand side you can see a patient who has a collection of this um, amyloid structure. Um, and this is a very high magnification picture of, an of a bunch of amyloid fibrils. So you can see these long filaments uh, that are made. So if we talk about it in terms of Alzheimer's disease, which is what I'm here to talk about today, um, we can sort of imagine it um, as um, a collection, oh, uh, somebody said, called it earlier, and I'm trying to remember who it was, but said that it was like a collection of rubbish. Yes, it was used as a metaphor of a kitchen uh, where you've got loads and loads of rubbish and how do you clear out the rubbish? Um, and so what we have is a collection of these amyloid fibrils in amyloid plaques in Alzheimer's disease. And then if we zoom in and have a look a bit more on these, uh, at higher magnification, we can see these protein fibers that are made. And what we're really interested in is what is the structure of this uh, protein fibre? Uh, and so this is a, a still picture of what we think it looks like. And you can sort of imagine it like a ladder. And each you could imagine that each one of these rungs of the ladder is an individual protein. And so they've stacked up to form this really, really um, very, very stable structure that can't be cleared by the body. Uh, and lots of different proteins, in this case, amyloid beta, but in lots of different proteins can stack up and self-assemble and form these structures. And so my last little bit, and I hope Adam has had his little break. So that's, <laughs> hopefully I've given him a break because he must be exhausted. Um, this is a, a movie showing the structure of an amyloid fibril. And um, in a moment, what you'll see is these protein chains uh, going across the fiber axis. And these little black dots are hydrogen bonds uh, that are holding the whole thing together, making this really, really stable structure. And looking down the axis of this fiber, you can see the individual amino acids, so the, the individual components that make up the proteins that, uh, that in interdigitate, so they stick together to form um, this very stable fibril. And what's happening is that we get a big collection of these amyloid fibrils in the brain, but also in other diseases, say, as I mentioned earlier, in the heart um, and so on. Uh, so I'll stop sharing now and hopefully uh, he's back. So that's interesting. So I hadn't, you know, the whole question about, because that comes up a lot, is, is is amyloid. So am I right in thinking that either you can have amyloid in your brain and not have Alzheimer's? Because uh, Yes. Yeah, so I think a few people have mentioned that, that, that I think that the link between amyloid and Alzheimer's disease, amyloid beta and Alzheimer's disease, is sometimes a bit controversial because there are people who are discovered with lots of amyloid fibrils in their brain, but they don't appear to have any symptoms. The thing is though, is that Alzheimer's disease is basically diagnosed as having amyloid beta in your brain. So without it, you don't have Alzheimer's disease. You may have a different sort of neurodegenerative disease, which involves a different protein, but unless you've got amyloid beta in there, you haven't got Alzheimer's disease, you've got a different neurodegenerative disease, if that makes sense. A lot of the uh, drugs that are being developed are targeting the amyloid, aren't they? Yeah, they are. And I think that's been a real problem because um, amyloid beta um, seems to be probably the first thing that happens. And maybe it happens really early, way before we know what the symptoms are, or we've we've noticed any symptoms in a person. And so that creates a real problem because when do you, do you can, how can you treat somebody before you know that they've got the disease? Um, and so we'll, we, you know, we're still trying to understand how amyloid beta is involved in the disease and whether it's maybe a trigger that leads to tau aggregation, which then causes the neurodegeneration, maybe tau's a good target and so on, but we don't know. But understanding the structure of these things is really important because we know that in all of these different diseases, the neurodegenerative diseases like Parkinson's and Huntington's and frontal temporal dementia, and then also things like you know heart disease and um, other sorts of amyloidosis, we get this um, insoluble protein structure. And so we need to know 
how to get rid of it or how to stop it from happening. And we need to know the structure. Yeah. And, that, and that's why I guess we haven't got many people talking about this today, but obviously astrocytes and microglia have been such a big thing that have been talked about in conferences over the last... I, honestly, I don't think I'd even heard of astrocytes being talked about until about maybe two years ago. I'm not sure they were getting researched before, but they've become yeah. a massive focus of conferences in the last two years, particularly. I guess um, it's about it's about appreciating how complex the puzzle is, and it's not just about looking at one single thing. And actually, it's a summation of many things. And and hopefully, the people who are watching today who have you know found the link on Facebook or somewhere like that that aren't from a science background will will have an appreciation that this is the reason why there isn't a new magic treatment is is because we're still fundamentally understanding it. I mean, how I mean, this is it's not even been de defined as a disease for you know, for that long compared to other things. Sam, let's talk about your work. Tell us about your research. Yeah, well, actually, it does link in to what you were talking about a second ago and the fact that a big problem with trying to find any form of therapy is the fact that by the time someone gets diagnosed, it's really too late to, to get an, an effective therapy. And so we're quite interested in trying to develop better systems in the lab to try and model the early mechanisms. And then by doing that, try and find new therapeutic targets. But what, one of the issues is the fact that a lot of the models we have at the moment have a lot of shortcomings. So uh, there's a lot of, there's been a lot of very useful data that's come out of things like animal models, but it often doesn't translate into uh, good clinical data because uh, obviously things like mice and rats don't naturally get Alzheimer's. The amount of mutations you have to give them to, to get that sort of phenotype is just, is far well, beyond you, what you would see in a person. Sense. I agree. How many times have you seen the news headlines saying that we can now cure Alzheimer's in, in mice? I mean, that, yeah. that's... And what, what they're essentially saying is we can cure them of something we've given them. Um, and so what we're quite interested in is actually taking stem cells from patients who've got Alzheimer's and growing those in the lab and studying the differences that they have with stem cells from a healthy person, because you can take a sample of skin from somebody and uh, via various different reprogrammings eventually get yield brain cells that have the same mutations that are present in the patient's brain the problem that, is well okay. i was just going to say i can see the value of that as well because using that means because i mean diseases develop over time as well so using yeah. samples from people who have the disease now could look different to people who had the disease 50 years ago because if we're being told that pollution and environment factors and diet and things like that have changed i mean even in the last 10 years those things have some things have gotten worse and some things have gotten yeah. better. So testing on the current population, not using samples from a while ago, must be useful. Or might... Yeah, it's, and it's about getting as many patient donors as possible to get an understanding because it's a, it's a spectrum of mutations and changes. But the problem is usually when people work with these cells, they grow them in, I've actually got physical aids, they grow them in something that looks a little bit like this, which is basically a, either a plastic dish or, or a flask or a plate. And I think it doesn't, take a lot to realize that that's not representative of a brain and actually growing cells on something like that is kind of like I sort of liken it to taking a car apart and placing all the parts of the car on a mat and saying that that's a functional car and it's not really what you need to do is build it into its three-dimensional structure for it to actually work and you can get some useful data out of growing cells on plastic but a lot of the things that we're interested in particularly with what you were talking about with protein aggregation can't take place on something like this because any protein that a cell produces uh, just basically dissolves up into the liquid media above it. So what we're trying to do is actually look at the brain itself and think how can we build something three-dimensional that we can put cells in that then gives them an environment that's more close to the brain. And I can quickly show you a couple of images in a second, but this is a visual representation of it. So the idea is we have, this would realistically be about the size of a five penny piece, but it's this three-dimensional sort of jelly-like structure which is a lot more similar to what the structure of the brain is that is then populated with our these sort of plastic uh, ideas of neurons brain cells and so if i can quickly share my screen for a second i can yeah. give you a little bit more detail on that it can look quite complex but this is essentially the the different um proteins and sugars that make up the actual brain so the the, the solid piece of uh, we call it the matrix but the actual physical nature of the brain is made up by these different proteins and sugars and so it's all about looking at what makes up these, uh, these networks of materials and then saying, how can we design our own 3D gel that allows us to put in our 
uh, patient brain cells and actually get them to mature uh, and develop into this active network of, of, of cells that can communicate with each other. Um, so I've got a little video here of, uh, these are cells within one of our uh, gels that we've designed. And uh, if you can see the, the little flashing images, I'll let this loop around again. These are actually firing signals to each other. So we're building this three-dimensional active network. And if we apply it correctly, we can actually start to get to a stage where we can start to see these green blobs are actually what we think are amyloid plaques starting to form within these structures. And this is without any uh, genetic modification from us. We're taking patient cells, putting them into a suitable uh, three-dimensional uh, gel system and starting to see those uh, disease pathways uh, unfold. And by doing so, we can then try and look at some of those early changes and try and find some of those potential therapeutic targets. So that's just one side of what we do in our group. There's a lot of other things as well, but for myself in particular, that's uh, that's what I tend to focus on because that's my background is around those uh, materials and how to apply them to, to make better models of how we can study diseases in the lab before we then go into clinical trials, try and get better data before moving into clinical trials. So I hope that summarized it well enough. It did, sorry. I was desperately trying to find it on mute <laughs> that's that's fascinating uh, is the, louise is that how do you sit on trying to do things in a different structure than in a dish because she is a lot of your work in dishes yeah a lot of our work is in dishes right? <laughs> yeah, okay. yeah. Uh, and I, th I mean what we always want to do is to make our model systems closer and closer to what's actually physiologically happening in a person of course I mean if we could use a person it would be ideal but obviously I don't think anyone's volunteering for that and um I think what's really interesting about what Sam said is how how do you make a matrix that is a bit like a brain in which you grow the cells so am I allowed to ask a question <laughs> Yeah, you. Yeah, what do you oh, make right. it out of, Sam? I mean, or is it a secret? No, it's not a secret. It's, it's something you can buy on on uh, any science warehouse for for a very low sum of money. Um, and I can send you a paper um, if you want to send me an email that we published on one of these matrices. Um, th there are lots of different options, and actually, I think that's one of the reasons because our lab also does a lot of work in dishes as well. This is just a branch of the research we do. I think it can be overwhelming because there are so many options and some of them can be very expensive but actually all we do is we look at what's in the brain look at some of the common components and then look at materials that are structurally similar to that so uh, there's a, a, a sugar or polysaccharide in the brain called hyaluronin which you can make a gel out of but it's extremely expensive but because um, i've done a lot of work on different materials we actually use a sugar called alginate which comes from seaweed and it's very structurally similar to hyaluronin so you can very easily make a gel out of alginate and through a very simple modification, get uh, brain cells to attach to it and form these networks. Uh, so that's one of the materials we use. Another one is um, something called gel and gum, which you might have in your food cupboard at home. It's a, a vegetarian alternative to gelatin. You can also use that for these kind of applications. There's a whole spectrum of different materials that you can look at to give you the right response. And you can very easily tailor them to give you the right properties to suit the cell type that you're interested in. Um, so it's it's just a case of um, looking into the literature about what other materials have been used already and starting to sort of a little bit of a play around with, with different ones. Uh, but like I said, if you want more details, I can send you a couple that we've already published that, that, we, that seem to work quite well, which Sounds is always right. a, a good starting starting point. Mm. So, so, I mean, so, I mean, technology is progressing quite, you know, quite quickly. Is, is I mean, in, during the time you've been researching Louise as, as the technology the new technology for things that's coming along helping I mean is, is tech going to help in the lab oh is I mean from my point of view it's been amazing I have been working in this field for quite a long time as you referred to thank you um, no, <laughs> <laughs> that's okay but but I mean from specifically from the point of view of some of the our early work so we um we use electron microscopy to look at the structure of proteins. And um, there's a, a method called cryo-electron microscopy that allows you to basically freeze the proteins and gives you loads more information about the, you know, the positions of the atoms in the protein. And in the last 20 years, there's been an amazing advance in um, these, um, these applications so that now we can, um, people have solved the structure 
of the tau filaments that have been isolated from Alzheimer's brain. And so we know, we do know now what these things look like. You know, we know where all the atoms are. Um, and that has happened, you know, because of Im really impressive advances in, in scientific technology. Um, so I think somebody was saying earlier about, you know, where funding should go and, you know, should you put it into one place or another place? And actually, sometimes you just get new, you know, new advances in particular technologies that you didn't expect. Um, so it's, it just seems really important to not be sort of closed down, but to be very broad. And, you know, funding is, is really, really important. And you were saying um, it costs £120 um, to look at a structure, and that would be quite a low estimate, really. And then, you know, the, I think the most important thing about funding actually is the people. Because, you know, Sam's just talked about his own his own um, input into how they're growing these stem cells. And if without him doing that, then obviously there would be no stem cells growing. And I think it's, it really is about the researchers that's, you know, where most of the money actually does go, um, is investing in people. Absolutely agree. I mean, you can buy some big expensive pieces of kit, which are nice as well. But if you, you, you know, and we all know it's a stat that's commonly used. Both charities use this about the number of people working on other diseases compared to Alzheimer's and dementia is, is you know, not, mm. you can't even compare the two. There are far fewer people working in this. And this year, uh, the charities have not been able to put those funding calls out, which means that there are going to be a few less PhD students and people with their fellowships funded in the first part of next year as a result of this. So keep the donations coming, everybody. There's a session later on today that you might both find interesting. We've got uh, Claire Durant uh, from University of Edinburgh, but we've also got Eric Dine from Kent State, who I introduced before, who's working on nanomedicine and magnetothermal reactions. Again, when we start to look at these kind of clever, new, innovative approaches, that's he's on at half past six today, if anybody's interested in coming back or joining us or sticking with us for the next two hours <laughs> till we can get around to Eric at half past at half past six. So what's uh, just we've got uh, we haven't had any questions actually we've had a comment Hector Perez says a uh, very interesting professor circle thank you for presenting. Um, um, what's I mean where how where's the next innovation coming? Where's the next kind of breakthrough coming through? Are you close to something that you're, what's exciting you most right now, Sam? We'll come to you first. Uh, well, I mean, there's a couple of things, but one of the things that's caught my interest in the last couple of years is, is taking the 3D side of things to the next level with um, the 3D bioprinting. Uh, and by doing that, because uh, this is something I worked a lot on during my PhD, trying, so it, it, what we have at the moment is a single cell type in one gel, one material, but actually, if you look at the brain, it's a lot more complex than that. There's layers of different materials, different cell types interacting in very specific locations. And so the next step is to try and, uh, using something like bioprinting, make structures that are different. They have gradients in terms of the biology, in terms of the materials. And by doing so, generate that something that's essentially a mini brain. And then by doing that, try and probe it for different things. So I think it's interesting to talk about technology. I think that's is the dictator of something like this is actually having the technology to make something that is that specific and precise and i think just something like that would be really exciting to have 3d bioprinting you preload with your stem cells that can yeah i mean how exciting yeah. would that i am I'm, I'm quite into my sci-fi i listen to a lot of sci-fi audiobooks you know but and um that we have already exists inside yeah we have got a little <laughs> bit of prelim a preliminary, preliminary work we have been bioprinting some of these cells uh, but it's just finding the right application at the moment because what we would like to do at the moment, the technology is not quite there to get that resolution. So we can do some stuff, but not quite what we want to do just yet. But it's it's getting there, which is which is exciting. What about what about for you, um, Louise? Oh well, I suppose um, just the idea of of taking into account, you know, people's lifespan in a way. So going from you know some tiny structure, but but broadening out to thinking about what is it that actually triggers Alzheimer's disease. We know that some people get it genetically, but most people, something like 95% of people get it for no reason we know. Um, and sort of tracking it back to that early stage where something has happened that triggers the disease. And by um, <clears throat> incorporating the sorts of things that Sam's talking about, where we actually are using human 
cells, that seems really important to me. So I think that's where we're going to see things changing. I, I agree. And, and I mean, that Danielle made that point earlier about, you know, looking at uh, the brain post-mortem, the number of people who have, oh, was it uh, Christina? I forget who about uh, what infections are in the brain post-mortem and things like that and looking mm -hmm. at whether that triggered a deterior a rap more rapid deterioration and things. Yeah. Uh, and because all that will add to that, you know, the number of, I've got family members who say, oh, well, so-and-so smoked all his life and lived till he was 110 and in the end, there's always that one example, isn't there, of the, yeah. he's the, PDP, you know, that standard person is the person we need to research to understand what they did. <laughs> yes, yes, plenty of gin. <laughs> Thank you very much, <laughs> yeah. uh, Professor Louise Circle and Dr. Sam Mopson uh, from Thank Manchester you. and Professor Six for joining us over the last half an hour.